Congratulations, you're almost there. This is part four of five parts on clinical anatomy of the thorax. In presentation number three, we learned about pleural effusions and how to drain that fluid using a procedure called a thoracentesis. In this presentation, we'll learn about collapsed lungs, known as pneumothoraces, and how to treat them by placing a chest tube, and how the clinical anatomy of the ribs and the neurovascular bundle become important when we place that chest tube. We'll also talk about how we diagnose the fluid from an effusion and how we can actually surgically treat a pleural effusion to keep it from coming back. That's called a pleurodesis. We keep talking about a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. Let's take a look at an image of how this can occur. In the upper image, we can see how a puncture in the parietal pleura can cause the lung to collapse. In other words, we lose the negative pressure which is innately present in the thoracic cavity. The lung will simply collapse and the bulk of the air on inspiration will go towards the good lung. Then we can begin to see as the good lung begins to expand, it actually will push the mediastinum towards the side of the pneumothorax. The airflow will begin to be pushed out of the pleural defect and the empty pleural cavity will begin to mildly get smaller under atmospheric pressure. But before you think you understand pneumothoraces, let's talk about what happens if you have a defect or a stab wound in the parietal pleura and at the same time it stabs the lung and now the lung is leaking air. There's another condition. What happens if you have a broken rib and the rib snaps and punctures the lung but doesn't have an external communication to the air outside? There's all different kinds of pneumothoraces, but you have to understand the respiratory physiology. Here's a chest x-ray in a child showing a simple pneumothorax. The red arrow is showing us the lung and the blackness around the lung is the excess air from the pneumothorax. This child does not appear to have any evidence of broken ribs or communication with the external air. The cause of this pneumothorax was probably rupture of the lung itself from high pressure ventilation. If you look carefully, you can actually see an endotracheal tube up high in the carina. There are two tubes present here. There's an endotracheal tube, there's a tube in the stomach, and then there's a larger tube outside. And I'm not sure what that tube is, but there is a tube in the trachea above the carina. And you can see how the mediastinum is shifting just a little bit. If they don't treat this injury, this simple pneumothorax will turn into a tension pneumothorax. Having spoken about a tension pneumothorax, let's look at one. Here's an example of a stab wound to the left chest. Air is rushing in and collapsing the left lung. Whenever the patient takes a breath, the diaphragm drops and the right lung will expand. However, if this patient has a one-way valve, what will happen is the air, which is eventually rushing in, can't get out. The thorax will begin to shift. The mediastinum will move away from the side of the pneumothorax. Let's take a look. Here's a tension pneumothorax. Here, the red arrow is showing us the collapsed lung. You can see the air around the collapsed lung showing us a black density. The yellow arrow is showing us the midline. In other words, it's showing us the spinous processes coming off the thoracic vertebra. The white arrow is showing us the trachea and how it's shifted away from the midline. And the blue arrow is showing us the carina, the left and right main stem bronchi. You can see how the air, just lateral to the red arrow, is beginning to collect in the patient's right hemithorax and because there's a one-way valve somewhere it's pushing the lung and the mediastinum towards the patient's left. This is a tension pneumothorax. I suspect in this image just like the previous image there's probably a rupture in the lung tissue itself so that air can escape through the lung tissue but it can't get back in and communicate with the bronchus to be exhaled creating a tension pneumothorax.
You've seen this image before. Here we go again. Costodiaphragmatic recess, intercostal vein, artery, and nerve underneath the rib and where the fluid collects in that costodiaphragmatic recess. You already understand why this is important having watched the video on thoracentesis. Now we need to put a chest tube in. The way that we do this is we actually tunnel over the rib. Now remember, there are vessels that are on the superior aspect of the rib too, and we try to avoid those, but we don't go right smack in between the ribs. We actually tunnel it over the rib, puncture through the pleura, and into this pleural space. First, we make a small incision, and then we tunnel it through the skin until we approach the rib. Then, we tunnel the chest tube over the rib to avoid the intercostal bundle, which lies on the undersurface of the rib. Having tunneled the chest tube a centimeter or two from our initial skin incision, we puncture and pop into the pleural cavity. The easiest way to put one of these chest tubes in is to simply twist it and turn it as you advance it into the chest cavity. That will make sure that it goes in the right direction. As a surgeon, I've learned all kinds of little tricks to get these tubes to go in the right spot. This is a video in Clinical Medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. The insertion of a pleural chest tube is often done in a setting where immediate action is required. Nonetheless, adherence to sterility, analgesia, sound technique, and safety are always warranted. The most common indications for chest tube drainage are pneumothorax that is recurrent, persistent, under tension, or bilateral, any pneumothorax in a patient on positive pressure ventilation, hemothorax, recurrent or symptomatic large pleural effusion, empyema, and chylothorax. There are relative contraindications, mainly based on hematologic abnormalities, such as bleeding diatheses or coagulopathy. Blood products or coagulation factors may need to be transfused in order to reduce the risk of bleeding during the procedure. The procedure should be explained and consent obtained whenever possible from the patient or next of kin. A chest x-ray should be performed when possible prior to the chest tube insertion. Sterilized and fully prepared chest tube trays are often available in the hospital. The key materials required in addition are a sterile gown, mask, and gloves, sterile drapes or towels, local anesthetics such as 1% lidocaine, chlorhexidine cleaning solution and sterile pieces of gauze, 25 and 21 gauge needles, 10 cc and 20 cc syringes, a scalpel with size 11 blade, which should be on the chest tube tray, at least four or five dissecting instruments, such as Kelly curved clamps or artery forceps, which should also be found on the chest tube tray, non-absorbable strong sutures of size 1.0 or greater made of silk or nylon, a chest tube of appropriate size, a sterile drainage system, and dressings for the tube after insertion. The chest tube is sized according to its internal diameter. The length of the tube is marked with numbers to indicate distance into the chest wall. Additionally, there are several drainage holes at the distal end. A radio-opaque stripe runs along the length of the tube and outlines the most proximal drainage hole. This is used to confirm correct placement of the chest tube in the pleural space on a chest x-ray. Choosing the size of chest tube is based on the indications for the tube. In the case of a large pneumothorax in a clinically stable, spontaneously breathing patient, Chest tubes with an internal diameter of 16 to 22 French may be placed. In a patient with a large pneumothorax who is clinically unstable, the same rules for chest tube sizes apply. However, if the patient has underlying lung disease, requires mechanical ventilation, or is anticipated to have a large air leak, larger tubes from size 24 to 28 French are recommended. In order to drain a viscous hemothorax or empyema, or to evacuate a pneumothorax in a patient receiving mechanical ventilation, larger diameter tubes sized 28 to 32 French are more often employed. Newer evidence favors the insertion of smaller size 10 to 14 French catheters, or pigtail drains, for the drainage of pneumothoraces in clinically stable patients, and for malignant pleural effusions. This is done using a Seldinger technique with a guide wire, and often with ultrasound guidance. This technique differs from that used for larger chest tubes and will not be discussed further in this video. Once the chest tube tray is open and all the key instruments are identified, occlude the proximal free end of the chest tube with a clamp or forceps. 
Next, with another clamp or forceps, grasp the distal end of the tube. This will aid in passing the tube through the tract. The patient should be positioned either supine or in the semi-recumbent position. The ipsilateral arm may be maximally abducted to the side of the patient or, alternatively, positioned behind the patient's head in order to have optimal exposure of the insertion site. The ideal location for the placement of a chest tube is in the triangle of safety, the anatomical region defined by the lateral border of the pectoralis major muscle anteriorly, the mid-axillary line posteriorly, which is also the anterior aspect of the latissimus dorsi, the apex just below the axilla, and the horizontal level of the nipple inferiorly. The nipple line may be an unreliable landmark for female patients due to breast tissue. To help with landmarking, remember that the triangle of safety should approximately lie between the fourth and fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. Start your landmarking by localizing the clavicle. Next, count the rib numbers as your fingers traverse down the anterior chest wall. Once the correct intercostal space is found, Move your hand along the space laterally towards the anterior axillary line. The incision will be made here. The chest tube will actually be inserted one interspace above this point. Mark the incision spot with the imprint of the back of a needle or a pen marking. Once full barrier precautions are employed, use the chlorhexidine cleaning solution and sterile gauze to create a large sterile field on the patient's skin. Cover the field with sterile drapes so that only the procedure site is exposed. Adequate analgesia is a very important step in this procedure, as chest tube insertions can often be very painful for the patient. The skin, subcutaneous tissues, deeper tissue layers, parietal pleura, and periosteal surface of the rib below the intended insertion site must be generously anesthetized. Using the smallest gauge needle, create a wheel of anesthetic in the skin overlying the landmark spot. Using the larger needle, anesthetize the subcutaneous skin layers through the wheel, aspirating as the needle moves deeper. Anesthetize the periosteum of the rib that lies below the intercostal space where the tube will be inserted. Once the parietal pleura is encountered, a flash of pleural fluid will fill the syringe if a pleural collection is being evacuated. If a pneumothorax is being drained, the syringe may only fill with air as the needle enters the pleural space. Withdraw the needle, aspirating along the entire path. Make an incision approximately 1.5 to 2 cm in length above and parallel to the anesthetized rib. Introduce the curved dissecting instrument, such as a Kelly clamp, into the incision. Begin dissecting the subcutaneous tissues in order to reach the intercostal muscles. After dissecting through the subcutaneous tissues, stay on top of the rib to guide the blunt dissection. This will create a diagonal path towards the correct intercostal space. When using a larger chest tube of sizes 24 French or greater, use your index finger to explore the tract being created by blunt dissection. This is done to ensure the larger caliber tube will be able to pass through the tract. Once you have dissected through the subcutaneous tissues and deeper intercostal muscle layers, you will encounter the parietal pleura. Push the clamp gently through the parietal pleura. The entry into the pleural space through the parietal pleura is felt as a give or a sudden release of resistance. Alternatively, you may use your finger to penetrate through to the pleural space. Once the pleural space is entered, use your index finger to ensure the lung is not adherent to the chest wall, which may impede passage of the tube into the pleural space. Often, pleural fluid will trickle out through the tract, further confirming entry into the pleural space. Pass the tube through the incision unclamp the jaws of the kelly, and then direct the tube through the tract slowly using your finger as a guide. If the tube is meant to evacuate a pneumothorax, aim it apically towards the top of the lung. If the indication is to drain fluid, aim it basally towards the bottom of the lung. Make note of the depth the tube has passed by keeping track of the numerical markings on the side of the tube. Secure the chest tube to the skin using the heavy sutures. Simple interrupted or mattress sutures are often satisfactory to ensure stability of the tube and avoidance of air leaks around the tube. The free ends of the sutures are wrapped around the tube and tied multiple times to secure it in place. Purse string sutures are not recommended as they yield poor cosmetic results and increase the risk of skin necrosis. Once the chest tube has been secured, a petroleum-based gauze dressing should be wrapped around it.
Apply several pieces of sterile gauze around the tube. Secure the site with multiple pressure dressings. A chest x-ray must be done to confirm correct placement. On an x-ray, the radio-opaque stripe is visible with an interruption indicating the position of the proximal hole. This hole must be within the pleural space. Otherwise, it is sitting outside the pleura and not draining effectively. This is an indication to replace the tube altogether. Do not advance the tube into the chest, as this can introduce non-sterile tubing into the chest cavity. Before unclamping the free end of the chest tube, firmly connect it to the sterile drainage system. Now, unclamp the free end. If pleural fluid is being drained, the fluid level in the drainage system will rise. If a pneumothorax is being evacuated, air bubbles will appear. Do not reclamp the chest tube while there is bubbling. This may lead to recollection of a pneumothorax and may even result in a tension pneumothorax. Most commercially available drainage systems use the three-bottle model of closed drainage and suction. The most important bottle is the underwater seal, which serves as a one-way valve that allows air and fluid to leave the pleural cavity without the risk of re-entry during inspiration. All available pleural drainage systems contain the underwater seal bottle. Bubbling may be seen in this bottle. This will indicate whether there is an ongoing air leak either from the patient or from the system itself. The two other bottles that may be present in the drainage system are a collection bottle connected directly to the patient for accumulation of pleural fluid and or debris, and a suction system that connects to wall suction but regulates the amount of suction actually delivered to the pleural space via a column of sterile water. Suction may be applied if there is a persistent pneumothorax despite the underwater seal or if a viscous pleural collection is not draining effectively. When evacuating chronic large pleural effusions, the risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema has been well described. A stepwise approach to the drainage of chronic large pleural effusions is recommended, not exceeding 1 to 1.5 liters within a 30-minute period. The pleural drainage system must be kept approximately 40 inches below the patient in order to prevent retrograde flow of air or fluid back into the pleural space. There are complications associated with the insertion of a chest tube. These include bleeding and hemothorax, traumatic perforation of the lung, heart chambers, diaphragm, or intraabdominal organs, intercostal neuralgia due to trauma of the intercostal neurovascular bundle, intermittent blocking of the tube with clot or debris, subcutaneous emphysema, re-expansion pulmonary edema due to more than 1 to 1.5 liters of fluid drainage in less than 30 minutes, infection of the drain site, and empyema. The timing of chest tube removal depends on the indications for the chest tube. In the case of a pneumothorax, bubbling must have ceased, the patient stabilized clinically, and the lung re-expanded on a chest x-ray as minimal criteria to remove the tube. If suction is being applied to evacuate the pneumothorax, most clinicians perform a trial of underwater seal alone in order to ensure there is no further bubbling with the suction turned off. Most physicians will perform a chest x-ray 12 to 24 hours after the last evidence of an air leak prior to removing the tube. The decision to clamp the chest tube to check for a persistent air leak is one that is practitioner dependent and there is insufficient data to support or refute this practice. If the chest tube was placed to drain pleural fluid, once the drainage volume is less than 200 cc's in a 24-hour period and the fluid is serous, the tube may be removed. If a chest tube was placed for empyema, Removal of the tube should be considered only after the patient has stabilized clinically and the drainage criteria are met. If an air leak is persistent or the pleural fluid drainage criteria are not met, a pulmonary specialist or thoracic surgeon should be consulted for more definitive, potentially surgical management. Pneumothorax risk is no different after chest tube removal during end inspiration versus end expiration. Once the sutures are removed, instruct an awake patient to hold his or her breath either after a full inspiration or full expiration, or while performing a Valsalva maneuver. Pull the tube at end expiration if a patient is being mechanically ventilated. Ideally, two clinicians should be present during tube removal. Once the tube is removed, quickly seal the incision site with a petroleum-based gauze, reinforced with several pieces of regular gauze on top of it. Secure the site with a pressure dressing. Additional sutures may be required to close the incision. A follow-up chest x-ray should be obtained 
12 to 24 hours after the tube has been removed. Closely inspect for any suggestion of a new pneumothorax. Caution must be exercised when removing a chest tube from any patient on a mechanical ventilator, especially in those with high oxygen or positive pressure requirements, chronic lung disease, or other risks for recurrent pneumothorax. Experienced physicians should supervise the decision to remove the tube in these cases. The insertion of a chest tube is often done under extremely critical circumstances. However, using the appropriate techniques and sterile precautions will ensure safe and efficient performance. Once we've tapped the fluid and drained the pleural effusion, we need to send it to the lab so that it can be checked. I've asked you to memorize the total protein count because that's the most important measure. 3 grams per deciliter is the cutoff for measuring an exudate or a transudate. The second most important test is the LDH. We then also send it for a cell count. We send it for cultures to check for microorganisms. If we're suspicious for malignancy, they'll spin it down and see if there's any malignant cells. And then, of course, we'll ask for glucose and pH. There are some very cause-specific tests which we can ask. Triglycerides and chylomicrons and cholesterol will help us determine whether we have a chylothorax. Amylase can help us determine if the pleural effusion is from pancreatitis. Rheumatoid factor, of course, anti-nuclear antibodies can help us determine whether this is from an autoimmune disease. Carcinoembryonic antigen can help us determine whether there is a gastrointestinal malignancy. You'll learn about some of these in your later courses. The point is, we can test this fluid for just about anything. The most important one, total protein, LDH. Remember, total protein concentration is the most important choice if you can only do one test. But there are some other tests that we can do that will suggest, but are not entirely diagnostic, of an exudate. For example, if the pleural protein to serum ratio is greater than 0.5, or if the LDH, in other words, the, the thoracentesis fluid to serum LDH ratio is greater than 0.6, or if the pleural fluid LDH is greater than two-thirds of the upper limit of serum, these are suggestive but not diagnostic that it's an exudate. And if you remember, an exudate is most consistent with malignancy or infection or severe inflammation. If we ask the lab to spin down and look at the white cells, we can see that if most of them are lymphocytes, that usually means malignancy. If greater than 50% of the white cells are a result of a lymphocytosis, it can be from a lymphoma or a chylothorax or even tuberculosis. Neutrophils indicate inflammation or a piece of dead lung, i.e. a pulmonary infarct. Eosinophils are nonspecific. And if it's mostly mesothelial cells, where about 5% of these mesothelial cells are white cells, then the effusion is probably not from tuberculosis. Here's a slide which has been spun down and shows us cytology. This is actually a normal cytology from pleural fluid. I've circled the cells in the middle, which appear to be a clump of normal lymphocytes. Believe it or not, this is normal because most of the cells that we see here are not of the malignant lymphocyte variety. Yes, there's a lot of lymphocytes here and it's a clump, but this is normal. Today we're faced with patients who have HIV or other immunosuppressive diseases. And believe it or not, tuberculosis is on the rise. In patients with tuberculosis who have an exudated pleural effusion, we may or may not be sure of the actual cause. Sometimes we know it's tuberculosis, other times we don't, in which case we need to perform a pleural biopsy. Sometimes the pleural space infection can lead us to perform cytology, which is also performed when the cause of the effusion is unclear, and tuberculosis would need to be ruled out by sending acid fast stains and mycobacterial cultures. Biopsy of the pleura, however, is best today performed by a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. This allows us to put a camera into the chest and actually perform a pleurodesis with talc. Yes, it's the same kind of talc that you put on a baby's butt, except it's sterile so that we don't introduce any infection.
A pleurodesis is done to prevent the pleural effusion from coming back. When we spray baby talc into the chest cavity, it causes the lung to become an intense inflammatory mass and the parietal and visceral pleuras will stick to one another, decreasing the dead space which is available for a pleural effusion to form. Occasionally, the pleural space becomes infected and it forms an orange peel like around the lung. Then we have to operate and perform a decortication. Basically, this is like taking an orange and peeling it. Of course, video assisted thoracic surgery can also be done to completely remove the pleura, called a pleurectomy. We'll take a look at one of these videos in just a second. As you'd imagine, whenever you take somebody to the operating room and start playing around with the thoracic cavity, you can get lots of problems. You can get a persistent pneumothorax or low blood oxygen called hypoxemia. Bleeding is always a problem. You can damage a lung and poke a hole in it, causing a prolonged air leak. You can get subcutaneous emphysema. This is where leakage of air from the lung will escape through one of the small holes you've made in the skin to get into the lung cavity and the air tracks underneath the skin and when you go up and poke on the patient's thoracic skin it feels like the bubble wrap that we use to mail packages with. You can also infect the pleural space causing an empyema and if there's cancer you can seed each of your little tiny incisions with cancer cells and spread the cancer. In mesothelioma, which is a malignant form of a tumor caused from usual asbestos exposure, i.e. asbestosis, sometimes it's necessary to perform an open lung biopsy. This is preferred as opposed to performing a video-assisted lung biopsy. Remember, if someone has mesothelioma and the pleura is malignant and lined all around the thoracic cavity, with malignant mesothelial cells, no matter where we put our little port sites and our cameras, we're going to seed the skin. So instead, we make one small incision rather than many tiny incisions and take a piece of pleura for biopsy. The incision should be put where we would anticipate opening the chest should it become necessary. Because if tumor seeds our incision, we can always excise that tumor later. What about a malignant pleural effusion? This will occur in up to 65% of patients who have some sort of cancer. 75% of patients with a malignant effusion will have either lung or breast cancer. That's a huge number. Lung cancer, breast cancer. The aim of thoracentesis is to relieve their shortness of breath. And because the pleural effusion can often recur over a matter of three to five days, Repeat thoracentesis isn't recommended because it can spread the cancer, it can cause a pneumothorax, and simply you just can't keep sticking needles in someone's chest. I've already mentioned pleurodesis. This is where we spray baby talc into the thoracic cavity to cause an intense inflammatory response and decrease the recurrence of a pleural effusion. We also do what's called abrasion. We actually abrade and rub down the pleura to make it so that it will form intense adhesions. It's these adhesions which cause the pleura, i.e. the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, to stick together. Another odd way to deal with a recurrent pleural effusion is to put a small tube from the pleura into the belly. Basically, we drain the fluid from the lung cavity into the abdomen. This is an option. 20 to almost 60% of patients will pleurodese after 4 to 6 weeks of this. But experience is limited. It's not common. Complications such as infection can be quite high. The most common agent that we use to pleurodese is baby talc, except it's sterile. We put 4 to 5 grams of this in a slurry and we mix it with lidocaine or marcaine and then we blow it through a chest tube or do it through thoracoscopy. Thoracoscopy is more efficient and you'll see this in a video coming up. You don't want to do this bilaterally because it hurts and it can cause respiratory failure in up to 4% of patients or infection. If a patient has bilateral pleural effusions, put the baby talc in one thoracic cavity and wait see if it works, and maybe in a week or two, 
you can pleurites the other side. How do we deal with a pleural effusion which is caused from cancer? Well, we can drain it, we can put talc, we can also use a chemotherapy agent called bleomycin. This is common, but not as common as using talc. We can also scrub it down with a sandpaper-like substance and cause an intense inflammatory response. This is called abrasion pleurodesis. It will decrease the pleural space size and decrease the fluid production. In this three-minute video, which was downloaded from YouTube, we see a surgeon entering the thoracic cavity. He will perform a thoracoscopic pleurodesis and a biopsy of the pleura, as well as a thoracoscopic thoracentesis. Here the camera is inserted into the thoracic cavity, and we can readily appreciate fluid within the thoracic cavity. This pleural effusion does not appear to be infection. He will remove all of this fluid by merely sucking it from the thoracic cavity. The color of the lung here is normal. It is likely that this patient is not a smoker. The surgeon will choose a spot on the wall of the thorax to take a sizable piece of pleura for biopsy. Here he is using a cautery instrument over one of the ribs and will remove a sizable piece of pleura. This lining is then sent to the pathologist Here the pleural membrane is being removed from the underlying rib and innermost intercostal muscles. He will continue to remove a sizable portion of pleura and send it for pathological confirmation. This patient appears to be suffering from a lung cancer and as such most likely the effusion is a malignant effusion. He is continuing to take a sizable piece of pleura here the clear fluid from the pleural effusion can be seen there are multiple large white masses on this lobe of the lung consistent with carcinoma. Most likely this involves all lobes of the lung and in this patient he is most likely not a surgical candidate to remove either a lobe or the entire lung. I suspect this patient has metastatic disease to the hilar lymph nodes. Now the surgeon is blowing talcum powder into the thoracic cavity. This is called a pleurodesis. This is done to elicit an intense inflammatory reaction which will seal the visceral pleura to the parietal pleura, decreasing the thoracic space and decreasing the ability of the body to fill this with pleural fluid and decrease a recurrent pleural effusion. The talcum powder is sprayed generously. Now what happens if the patient presents with, let's say, pancreatitis? Pancreatitis can also cause a left-sided pleural effusion, and it can cause an infection in that space. A pleural space infection, also known as a PSI, can result from infection and bacteria that we've introduced or from a concurrent process called a para mnemonic effusion. So when pancreatitis, i.e. a disease of the pancreas in the abdomen, causes an intense inflammatory response in the lung, that's a para mnemonic effusion. So they can be either transudates or exudates, and usually an exudate is an empyema. In other words, there's pus in the pleural space. It can be loculated and very hard to drain, complicated or non-complicated. Remember, Empyema, pus in the pleural space, is different than pus in the lung. Pus in the lung is a lung abscess. That's different. I won't ask you to remember these stages. This is for completion only.
but there are usually three stages to the formation of a pleural space infection. There's an exudative stage where it forms an exudative effusion. It can be initially sterile and then it becomes infected. Then it begins to form the fibrinopurulent stage where it becomes from the exudate, it forms a fibrin deposit with increasing white cells. Then it begins to organize and form an orange peel rind over the lung so the patient can't breathe. This will lead to a decortication procedure. Most paranemonic infections or pleural space infections are caused from bacteria. You need to remember Staph aureus and Strep pneumonia. Those are the two biggest villains. You can also get anaerobes and of course gram-negative bacilli such as E. coli. But the ones you need to put in your memory bank are Staph aureus and Strep pneumonia. These are the ones you'll most commonly see as a clinician. A paranemonic effusion in this short one minute video, we will watch an opened thoracotomy being performed on a patient who needs a decortication. This is a result of a pleural space infection, usually long standing, that has resulted in the lung being entrapped by scar tissue and inflammatory tissue. The empyema has resulted in the growth of what appears to be almost like a rind on an orange. The surgeon will enter the chest cavity through an open thoracotomy incision and here he is using his finger to peel away the rind from around the lung. Once this peel has been removed, the anesthesiologist will be able to inflate the lung and allow for unrestricted lung movement. This is a decortication procedure for long-standing empyema. A paranemonic effusion can occur in up to 60% of patients who are hospitalized with pneumonia. So the patient presents with either a bronchopneumonia or a lobar pneumonia, and the intense inflammation can cause a pleuritis. The pleuritis in turn leads to an effusion, usually an exudative effusion. It can also occur after trauma, meaning rib fractures. Sometimes after a car wreck, Someone's ribs are broken, the intense inflammatory response causes a pleuritis. The pleuritis in turn leads to the formation of an effusion. What do we do when the patient presents with a pleural effusion with pneumonia? Sometimes we don't have to do anything. It'll go away on its own. Sometimes we need to do a thoracentesis or put a chest tube in. Other times we need to do a decortication and break down those adhesions or sometimes even to open the lung field and perform a thoracotomy. Fibrinolytic therapy, such as the introduction of streptokinase and urokinase to break up the adhesions can also be done, but that's not very common. Now here's where the pathology gets weird. A bronchopleural fistula. This is an abnormal connection between the pleura and the bronchus. What can cause this? Cancer? Eating away at the lung can cause a connection between the parietal pleura and between the visceral pleura. This can result in a connection between the two of them. Empyema, pus in the pleural space. Of course, tuberculosis can cause this. Or, what if we remove a lung, staple across the bronchus, and all of a sudden that bronchus leaks? Now we have air and bacteria entering an empty pleural space, which usually fills up with fluid. Then that infection begins to eat through the skin. Now we have a weird abnormal connection between the skin and the bronchus. This is called a bronchopleural fistula. This will make sense in just a second. Here's a patient who has a bronchopleural fistula. The entire right lung is missing and the large arrows show an open flap connection between the outside air and the hemithorax. The small arrows show the thickened, chronically inflamed pleura. This patient has had a procedure called an LOSR flap. This will allow the pleura, which is chronically infected, to remain open to the air and hopefully the infection will go away. There's a joke about this. And I'll explain that in just a second. You may wonder how a patient who has an LOS or flap is even alive. I will tell you by the time they've had this procedure done, their life has been hell. Usually they've had a lung removed because of lung cancer, 
and where the main stem bronchus was sewn off or stapled off, it leaks, causes an infection, and then they need further surgery. Here's the running joke. A guy walks into a bar, bets the bartender that he can put his head under water for 20 minutes and still breathe. The bartender takes the bet. What he doesn't know is that the guy has a LOS or flap and a bronchopleural fistula. So the guy walks in, puts his head into a bucket of water, and breathes right through the bronchopleural fistula. The air from the outside room enters his thoracic cavity, which is empty, which is empty and then goes right into his bronchus, crosses over his carina, into his good left lung. The guy collects on the bet and walks out. So if somebody tries to pull this on you, you might want to ask the guy if he has a bronchopleural fistula and an LOS or flap. Listen, we pull back a bunch of milky white fluid. This is called a chylothorax and is usually suggestive of a malignancy. Other causes can be surgery or perhaps even putting in a central line and lacerating the thoracic duct. Blockage of the thoracic duct from cancer or one of its tributaries can lead to chyle filling up the pleural space. The rate of normal chyle flow through the thoracic duct is about 100 cc's an hour, which is driven by our respiratory motions. The most common cause of a chylothorax is from surgery, cancer, or from putting in a central line and lacerating the thoracic duct. Here's what a chylothorax and its fluid would look like. It's a milky colored fluid. If we sent this to the lab, we would ask them to perform triglycerides, chylomicrons, and LDH count. Almost 80% of chylothorax are from a malignancy, usually from a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We would send the fluid for a triglyceride level and chylomicrons and also cholesterol levels. Here are some numbers which you don't need to remember, but they're just suggestive of a chylothorax. The presence of chylomicrons will be synonymous with a chylothorax. So how do we treat a chylothorax? How do we try to decrease the amount of chyle in the body so that it doesn't keep pouring into the chest cavity? Well, the first thing we do is conservative treatment. We don't feed the patient. And we definitely don't feed them any fatty foods. Then we give them intravenous nutrition through a central line. It's probably through that same central line that we lacerated the duct to begin with. And then we administer octreotide, which is called sandostatin. Sandostatin will decrease many hormonal substances in the GI tract and decrease the production of chyle. If the drainage is still more than 500 cc's a day, it's strongly suggestive that our treatment's not working and we're going to have to take the patient to surgery and tie off that thoracic duct. Don't worry, there's still a right-sided lymphatic duct and there are other ways that the body can get the chyle back into the system. We've already spoken a little bit about how to treat that chylothorax, but what if I have to take the patient to surgery? How am I ever going to find this tiny thoracic duct? Well, sometimes I ask the patient to drink a glass of milk right before we go to the operating room or give them some olive oil, 100 to 200 cc's right before surgery, and then I can find the duct because it usually is pouring out chyle. But this is uncommon and it's also hard to do. Early surgical intervention is encouraged because if we wait too long, we can deplete the body of its chyle, which can cause loss of lymphocytes, decrease in nutrition, loss of an immune response, and difficult to manage their intravenous fluids. We keep talking about central lines and IV nutrition and complications of central lines. Now let me show you what a central line is because this will be very important as you talk about pneumothorax, infected pneumothorax, or any of the complications of a central line insertion such as lacerating a thoracic duct. This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Evidence suggests that the risk of major central venous line complications, particularly line-related bloodstream infections,
is lower when the subclavian approach is used. This video will identify the landmarks and procedure for placement of a subclavian central line. Specific contraindications for the placement of a central venous line in the subclavian vein include infection of the area overlying the target vein and thrombosis of the target vein and fracture or suspected fracture of the clavicle or proximal ribs. Coagulopathy, while not an absolute contraindication, should be of greater concern with the subclavian approach because of the difficulty in applying direct pressure to the artery and vein as they pass under the clavicle. To assure that there is the highest level of sterility, the operator should wear a sterile gown and gloves, as well as a surgical cap, mask, and face shield. Most of the equipment can be found in commercially prepared kits and should include skin preparation solution, sterile towels or drapes sufficient to cover the entire body, 1% lidocaine, sterile 4x4 gauze, non-lure lock or slip tip syringes which are easy to remove from the needle, a number 11 blade scalpel, saline or heparinized flushing solution, a catheter with the appropriate length and number of lumens, a compatible skin dilator, usually one French larger than the line, an appropriate sized needle, a guide wire of compatible size which will pass through the catheter and needle, suture and a needle driver. There are numerous types of central venous catheters to choose from. Seven French triple lumen catheters of either 15 or 20 centimeter length are most commonly used in adults. For resuscitation or dialysis, large bore catheters are preferable since there is less resistance to flow than the smaller bore types allowing for much higher infusion rates, although large-bore peripheral IVs often allow even more rapid fluid administration than central venous lines. For small adults and children, or for those in whom access to the subclavian vein is difficult, five French and four French catheters can be used. If there are no contraindications, proceed by placing the bed in a 10 to 15 degree Trendelenburg position to decrease the risk of air embolism and to engorge the vein. Turn the patient's head so that the chin points away from the vein. A small roll can be placed under the spine to help make the clavicles more prominent. Identify the clavicle. The subclavian vein flows just under the middle third of the clavicle while the artery runs posterior and superior to the vein. The middle third begins at the point where the clavicle angles posteriorly and is joined by the costoclavicular ligament. It is only in this middle third that the vein closely approximates the clavicle. Because ultrasonography does not penetrate bone, usage is more challenging than in internal jugular placement. But several articles suggest it facilitates placement. To identify landmarks using ultrasonography, Place the probe just proximal to the insertion site. The vein and artery can be distinguished either by the compressibility of the vein or by using Doppler flow to demonstrate pulsatility in the artery. Prepare the area by scrubbing the skin with chlorhexidine for 60 seconds and drape the site. Be sure to include all landmarks within the sterile field. If the patient is conscious, explain that his or her face will be covered but that breathing will not be obstructed and that he or she can signal for attention by raising his or her hand. Flush the lumens of the central line with saline or heparin and ensure that the guide wire threads easily through your needle. Remove the cap from the port through which the guide wire will be threaded. This is commonly the longer lumen. In a patient who is awake or minimally sedated, the skin should be infiltrated with a local anesthetic such as 1% lidocaine with a 25 gauge needle to help minimize pain on insertion of the catheter. Using the insertion needle, approach the site at a 30 degree angle to the skin with the long axis of the needle directed toward the sternal notch. Puncture the skin just lateral to the middle third of the clavicle. Continue to aim toward the sternal notch with the needle tracking just beneath the clavicle, avoiding penetration into the deep tissues of the neck. Typically, the vein is accessed immediately beneath the clavicle, although needle penetration under the skin may reach several centimeters. An assistant should watch the monitor, looking for signs of arrhythmia during advancement of the guide wire. Arrhythmias indicate that the wire has reached the heart,
If arrhythmias occur, withdraw the wire slightly until they cease. After the guide wire has been inserted, withdraw the needle, leaving the guide wire in place. Using an 11-blade scalpel, make a small superficial incision at the entry point of the wire to facilitate passage of the dilator through the skin. Be careful not to cut the wire. Place the dilator over the guide wire, being certain to maintain control of the wire at all times in order to prevent a wire embolism, and advance the dilator 1 to 2 centimeters by holding it close to the tip and rotating it. Be careful not to introduce a bend or kink in the guide wire. Remove the dilator, anticipating increased bleeding. Maintain a grasp on the wire. A 4x4 gauze pad can be applied to the insertion site to minimize blood loss. Once again, only the wire remains in place. Now, feed the catheter over the guide wire, being certain to maintain control of the external end of the wire before advancing the catheter through the skin. This usually requires that the wire be pulled slightly out of the patient until the external end of the wire extends out of the catheter hub and can be grasped. While grasping the external end of the guide wire, advance the catheter over the wire using a rotating motion. If resistance is met, the track may not have been adequately dilated. Remove the catheter and try again to insert the dilator. Insert the catheter to a depth that places the tip at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. Remove the guide wire and check for blood return in all ports. Flush all ports, place caps on the hubs, and secure the line in place. Apply a sterile dressing before removing the drape. Obtain a chest x-ray to assess for proper placement and to assure that no hemothorax or pneumothorax has occurred. All sharps should be properly disposed in approved sharps containers. Scalpels should be retracted into their protective sleeves. Needle stick injury can be minimized by using needle lock devices found in most commercial central line kits. There are some common problems that can occur during placement of a central venous line. Puncture of the adjacent artery is usually obvious if pulsatile or bright red blood flows into the syringe. However, in patients with hypotension, hypoxemia, or both, it may be difficult to differentiate placement in the artery from that in the vein. The possibility of this complication should be recognized before the wire is inserted. If the catheter is in place and its location in the artery is suspected, the line should be connected to a transducing system. Pulsatility or any pressure higher than 30 millimeters of mercury or approximately 30 centimeters of hydrostatic pressure is probably arterial in nature. Ideally, transduction should occur before the wire is passed and should be performed routinely. If arterial puncture occurs, remove the catheter and place firm direct pressure on the site for 10 minutes or until there is no further bleeding. Occasionally, air may be aspirated into the syringe. If this occurs, check the syringe to be sure that the needle or catheter and syringe are firmly attached. If so, immediately remove the needle or catheter since there may be a pneumothorax at that site. This is especially important if the patient is having symptoms of increasing respiratory distress. Immediately obtain a chest x-ray and insert a chest tube if necessary. For persistent bleeding at the catheterization site, apply direct pressure and check the results of coagulation studies. Replace blood products as necessary. If bleeding continues, there may be an arterial or venous tear that requires surgical exploration. In any of these circumstances, do not attempt to place the line at the opposite site since you risk contralateral pneumothorax and further respiratory compromise. If arrhythmias are seen on the monitor, the line may be in the heart, in which case the line will need to be pulled back by approximating the necessary length of the wire before catheterization and confirming its placement with a chest x-ray, this problem can be avoided. Always be sure to work within a sterile field when placing a central venous line and to keep the site clean after placement to prevent local or systemic infection. If the wire will not thread through the needle, you may need to adjust the placement of the needle since it may have inadvertently been advanced during manipulation. If so, adjust the needle and re-aspirate 
to be sure that you are still within the vessel. If you are unable to reestablish blood flow, remove the needle and start over. If the vein has been difficult to cannulate, the presence of a clot in the needle will further complicate assessment of whether the vein has been successfully entered. In this circumstance, remove the needle and flush it thoroughly with saline to clear it before reattempting placement of the line. A sterile dressing should be placed on the insertion site. The dressing should be changed daily and whenever blood or liquid accumulates or it loses its seal. In order to minimize the potential for infection in the central venous line, the following precautions should be observed. The number of times the line is accessed should be kept to a minimum. Each time the line is accessed, this should be done under either sterile or clean conditions. The access site should be prepared with an alcohol-based solution. There should be a daily assessment to determine whether the central line is still needed so that it can be removed as soon as it is no longer necessary. A central venous line is a convenient and often necessary tool in the treatment of the critically ill patient. However, one must always be aware of the potential for infection. When that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the cause of the chylothorax, we usually see it, not surprisingly, on the left side. Remember, most of the body's lymph will return through the thoracic duct, which is at the confluence of the left subclavian vein and left internal jugular vein. It's best managed by first attempting to drain it with a thoracentesis. Then, if that doesn't work, blowing some talc in. Next, tying off the thoracic duct. And then even worse is a pleuroperitoneal shunt. There's also something called a pseudochylothorax. Thank God it's rare. It's associated with the formation of a persistent exudate that can last for months or even years. The most common cause is TB, tuberculosis. Rheumatoid arthritis is the second most common cause. The treatment is usually conservative. We try to let the body heal it on its own. It has high cholesterol in the pleural fluid greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter and cholesterol crystals. We've already mentioned causes of just pleural effusions, but what if they keep coming back? Well, you're going to have to blow some talc in there and hope that it goes away. The most common causes of persistent pleural effusions, ones that you just can't get rid of, include tuberculosis, cancer, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, connective tissue diseases such as lupus or sarcoidosis, drug-induced pleuritis, cirrhosis, the list probably goes on and on. You have to start thinking about weird stuff if you can't get the pleural effusion to go away. Four down and one to go. You've almost completed the entire series of five presentations on clinical anatomy of the thorax. Please remember that materials presented in this presentation are often the property of the respective copyright holders. In this case, many of the images belong to the publishers of the Tima Atlas, Lippincott, who publishes the Rowan's Atlas, and Toltec, who publishes the VH Dissector. Copyrighted materials can be used for educational purposes, and only one copy per student is permitted for educational purposes, and redistribution is not permitted.